In Jesus' parable, both good and bad seeds grow together in the field. What kind of seeds are you sowing? The Holy Gospel according to Matthew, the 13th chapter. Matthew writes, Jesus put before them another parable. The kingdom of heaven may be compared to someone who sowed good seed in his field. But while everybody was asleep, an enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and then went away. So when the plants came up and bore grain, then the weeds appeared as well. And the slaves of the householder came and said to him, Master, did you not sow good seed in your field? Where then did these weeds come from? He answered, An enemy has done this. The slaves said to him, Then do you want us to go and gather them? But he replied, No, for in gathering the weeds you would uproot the wheat along with them. Let both of them grow together until the harvest, and at harvest time I will tell the reapers, Collect the weeds first, bind them in bundles to be burned, but gather the wheat into my barn. The Gospel of the Lord. You may be seated. The judge looked down from his bench and in a somber voice declared, Mr. Wilson, this is your day of reckoning. And then he sentenced Mr. Wilson to eight years in a federal prison. And in response, Wilson's lawyer requested that he be allowed to have a few minutes with his family and friends before surrendering to the authorities but the judge said, Mr. Wilson's going to be taken by the marshals right now. You should have thought of that before. Wilson was one of four Tennessee men convicted of financial fraud and sentenced to prison in a recent case that was tried in Nashville. Five men were originally investigated, but the fifth man, by the name of Mark Jacobs, he was not arrested. He was not charged. Now, Mark Jacobs had been invited to join this financial scheme by four of his friends, the four guys that were, went to jail, and he was invited in a weekly Bible study. They had assured him that the plan was totally legit, totally legal, yet something inside Mark Jacobs said it wasn't right, it smelled fishy, and it was hard to say no to, to his four good friends, but he chose to go with his conscience and tell them that he would not participate. Now, the lawyers for the four guys who were convicted, they pleaded with the judge that their clients had simply made a mistake in poor judgment. They were good men. They loved their wives and their kids. They gave to charities. They were active in their churches. That the crime involved a gray area. They, they, they crossed a line that wasn't clear. Oh, but the judge disagreed. The judge said, it is not hard to determine where the line is. The guy who drew the line was Mark Jacobs. He knew what was right and what was wrong, and he did not hesitate. Hopefully, now, we will have four fewer people who are willing to walk up to the line and go over the line. We will have more people like Mr. Jacobs who would not touch this thing with a 10-foot pole, the judge said. Now, this case is just one example of so many of the moral an ethical crisis sweeping our nation. And in and, and every case like this, the caste changes. It involves stockbrokers, bankers, lawyers, TV evangelists, even a former president. But the script is always the same. We are a generation that is not sure exactly where the line is between right and wrong. And many don't believe that there is a line. Or if there is, they don't care. In 1966, an American professor named Joseph Fletcher published an influential book called Situation Ethics. And that term, Situation Ethics, has become part of our vocabulary. The basic premise of this book was that there is no, nothing that is universally good or bad, right or wrong, that there are no absolutes, that morals are determined by the situation, situation ethics. So an act that is right in one situation may be wrong in another. Do you believe that? Can there be black and white living in the gray world? Or are there moral absolutes like, like the Ten Commandments, for instance? Or is everything 
situational. If the desire of your heart is to be a better Christian and to live in the image of Jesus, we need to think seriously about the connection Jesus made between faith and morality, our behavior. What do you think when you hear the word holy? I always think of other people, right? Most of us think of someone else, not ourselves. A major characteristic of a holy person is purity, someone that is pure, spotless, stainless. But purity is not an accident. It doesn't just happen overnight. In the Bible, Peter compared purity to the process of purifying gold. Gold has to be heated and reheated several times for the alloys and for the impurities to be, to, to be brought to the surface where the goldsmith can remove them. If, if, if we forget that becoming pure is a process, we, we risk becoming overwhelmed by the discouragement we experience with the inevitable setbacks when we try to live moral lives. Still, it's not enough that we just desire to be pure. We also need a plan. And you've heard the old ancient saying, a, a journey of a thousand miles begins with the first step. So what will be your first step? Where can you begin? If you look in your bulletin there at the sermon, I've got four quick steps for us that we can begin to move beyond just good intentions and travel down the road to purity. Step one, make a decision. There's a good old twangy country song I love that says, you got to stand for something or you'll fall for anything. That's actually a quote of Alexander Hamilton. Hamilton said, you must stand for something or you will fall for anything. Make a decision and draw your line. Decide not to defile yourself. The dictionary defines defile as to make unclean, to corrupt the purity of or the perfection of, to debase, to sully, to taint, dishonor, contaminate, pollute, soil, poison, smear, blot, blur, stain, tarnish, profane, infect, dishonor, disgrace. That's not a pleasant list of words, is it? Stand firm. Stand tall for what you know to be right. Do not defile yourself. Every day we come to some fork in the road, we face tough choices, and what we decide at that fork is greatly influenced by the choices we made the day before about the kind of person we are. Step one, make a decision. Step two, choose to put first things first. It's not easy to be pure in an impure world. How do we become pure? The answer is to immerse ourselves in, in, in worship, in reading the Bible, in serving, in praying. This is the stuff, this is the content of faith. And not just reading and worshiping and serving and praying, but being open and allowing God's Holy Spirit to plant God's truth deep into our hearts and minds. Put the first things first. Step three, determine where the line is and stay a safe distance behind it. We want to be strong and victorious over temptation. We want to hear God say to us, well done, you good and faithful servant. We want our lives to be characterized by integrity. Problem is each one of us has blind spots, weaknesses that are deeply entrenched habits that sabotage our best intentions. We need to determine what kind of things are healthy for us and what kind of things are not healthy. So I ask you, in what areas of your life do you consistently struggle? Are there any particular sins to which you are always vulnerable? Moral failure is really the result of a blowout. Almost always it is the result of a slow leak. Determine where that line is for you and pray about it and seek the counsel of your wise friends. And once you've decided where your line is, then walk 10 yards back and make that your line. Step three, find your line and stay behind it. The final step, step four, is guard 
the little things. Jesus said, whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with very much. The truth is, there are no little things. How we handle the seemingly little things determines over time our response to the big things. And beware of the temptation to justify or rationalize your behavior. Instead of thinking, oh, it's not that bad. I've seen worse. No, instead of wondering what's wrong with a certain behavior, ask yourself, what's right with it? Ask, is what I'm considering more likely to move me closer or further away from my goal of being a faithful follower of Christ? If there is any hope, any hope for our marriages, our families, our cities, our nation, our civilization, we, we, the people of God, must passionately embrace the biblical standard for who God would have us be. It's not enough to give mental assent to the truth. We must make a commitment to be people who are not afraid to count the cost and stand tall. We want our lives to count for something. And Jesus encouraged us when he said, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. So there is right and wrong in every situation. We are called to black and white living in a gray world and to always act as Jesus would act. And that's why we gather like this, right? To remind ourselves to be accountable, to to help one another, to support each other, to remember this high calling of what it means to be a disciple of Jesus. And to always, always, always to live out our mission in all things. Love God, love others, serve. Amen.